This morning I wanted to talk about a a gospel-centered partnership. Your church has a history. I read a little bit about it. Since its beginning in 1987, uh, as an English language group that met uh, in the, this chapel at uh, the, what used to be the seminary here in, in Rushlikan. But your church has met in several different locations over the years and has had several different names. Uh, it was called the Lake Zurich Baptist Church, IBC of Vadensville, and of course IBC Zurich. And many pastors have come and gone, and multitudes of church members and visitors have come through the doors of your church. Your church, like most of our uh, IBC churches, is made up of what I, I like to refer to as global nomads, uh, whether they are uh, international business people and their families or students, uh, nationals who live in the country where the church is, refugees, perhaps diplomats, and other types of people. People from around the world. And your church is also a vital part of the Swiss uh, Baptist Union here uh, in Switzerland, as well as the International Baptist Convention. And of course, you are also a part of God's global church, which, uh, as Bob mentioned earlier, which Christ started, and which is made up of people from all nationalities, all languages, all cultures, and all generations from the first century until now, or we could even go back into the Old Testament saints of old, but uh, certainly from Pentecost on the church as it is. Jesus said, I will build my church and nothing can stop the spread of Christ's church. In the early years of the New Testament church, there was a church in Antioch in Syria. And this was a church that had a heart for the world. This was the church that sent the person we know of as Paul the Apostle and also Barnabas out. And they made several different journeys. And during Paul's second missionary uh, journey, he had a vision as he was uh, in what today would be the western edge of Turkey. Paul saw a vision. He saw a man in Macedonia, which today would be part of the eastern Macedonian part, in, uh, but part of Greece, I believe. And this man in Paul's vision was saying, come over and help us. And this is what brought Paul from what today is Turkey over uh, the Aegean and he came to Philippi. And Paul and Barnabas and perhaps a few others that were with them uh, began a church there. The first church in Europe would be the church in Philippi, at least what is Europe today. So in a sense, we go all the way back. You and I and your church were in God's heart From the earliest times. The church belongs to Christ. And no one else. And he is using his church to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Someday you might be able to see how much God has used your church through the years. To reach people with the gospel as these global nomads have passed through the the doors of your church building and into your lives. You are good news to your community and beyond your community because we have the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a world that is full of bad news, the message about Christ is good news. It's God's good news. The IBC, uh, the International Baptist Convention, is a family of international English language churches. We're scattered in almost 25 different countries around the world. And we began in 1958. The, The mission of our family of churches is to mobilize and multiply disciple making churches. We want churches that have the gospel at the very center. Of their, ch- of their church, of all of our churches. And our vision is that we would become a movement of global-minded churches that are reproducing healthy disciples and healthy leaders 
and healthy churches. And so our goal is uh, what I try to do and what we try to do together is to come alongside churches. Some of our churches are healthy and some are not so healthy. Some are large, others are very small. Some are strong, others are weak. But we want to encourage and equip or mobilize them to make disciples, lifelong, loyal, loving, learning followers of Christ. Back in October, I I shared with our our leaders and those that were at our annual meeting uh, what was on my heart about focusing for this year, 2020. And our focus could be used under the theme of partnership and progress in the gospel. And it was inspired by the passage that we're going to be looking at uh, this morning. 2020 is a significant time for the IBC. Uh, And so we want to focus on partnership. We want more pastors and more leaders to work together in planting churches and doing mission ventures and growing in leadership effectiveness. And we also want church members to be involved not only in your own church, certainly that's the, the, the primary part, but also with others uh, through our conferences. Uh, also, as we pray together, each week we send out a, what we call the care net and we list the needs of various churches. Uh, you can ask your, your men about one of the ways that uh, our churches have been partnering together. Uh, it was this, this seminar that I mentioned about the man with the beard and the mission uh, He's involved in some work in Lesbos, Greece. Philip is his name. Philip Vandegrift is a man whose life was radically changed just a few years ago. Uh, He lives in Wiesbaden, Germany. And he shared at the the men's conference this week about an organization that was started by one of our churches. But many of our other churches have joined with them. Uh, the, The organization is called All for Aid. And it's a ministry that was started to... Uh, to try to reach out and assist the refugees that were coming into Lesbos, Greece, from Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq, uh, from Syria. Uh, Camp Moria is what it's called. And and there are about 18,500 refugees there right now. And it's in a place that was built to hold 2,000 to 3,000 people. So you can imagine the, the challenges that they have. And so... Uh, this, they're not the only organization, uh, but they join other organizations that are trying to minister to these people. It was started by one of our churches, but many of our churches are working with them. And God is blessing this ministry of sharing love. And it has opened up doors for sharing the gospel. And Philip shared about how people are coming to know and follow Jesus as a result of that. Another way that we're partnering together is uh, our annual offering that we took up in December went to support a, uh, a ministry called Kainos, which was started by our pastor's wife in, in uh, Stuttgart, Germany, to minister to women, girls, and boys who have been caught up in human trafficking and prostitution. Uh, many of our churches are working uh, with them as, as partners. And just tonight uh, at the men's conference, we're going to be taking up an offering for uh, the IBC Church in Cologne, Germany. Uh, David Martin is a young pastor there, and he, they are, his church is starting what they're calling the Aquila Initiative. You remember Priscilla and Aquila were business people who worked alongside Paul at, in planting churches. And uh, their pastor, David Martin, and others from his church, uh, who are leading worship, uh, actually, at the men's conference this uh this week, but David has a vision of bringing people in to train them for a year and to help them to combine business as mission uh, with a view that they would be church planters or involved in church planting. There's no telling how much good we can do when we combine our efforts for the glory of God. We want to focus on partnering together as churches, and I Uh, just encourage you to look for and to find possibilities for yourself as a church. And then we also want to make progress. We want to uh, support our churches to become more effective in accomplishing God's mission of making disciples of all nations. 
We want to see more churches planted with greater support. We want to see more health in our churches, more leaders developed, more disciples made, more people reached, more believers sharing their faith, more sharing of stories of how God is working in our lives because it brings encouragement uh, for all of us. In March, our ministry leadership conference in Dubrovnik, Croatia, will focus on discipleship in our churches, including evangelism. How do we share the gospel one-on-one, or how do we as churches most effectively share the gospel with our, in, in our international context? We know it is in God's heart that more people would come into His kingdom. And we know that we have the good news of Jesus Christ who offers hope. And then a third focus that we're going to have this year is transition. Uh, we're praying for and working toward a smooth, effective transition as I retire this coming December. Uh, as I mentioned, we've served uh, as of now about 27 years, but at, in December it'll be about 28 years. Uh, for 10 years as pastor of uh, the IBC Church in Kaiserslautern, in Germany, and then it's 17 years now uh, living in Frankfurt and working with all of our churches. And I want to finish well. Uh, pray for this search team. Uh, they might be bringing a candidate as early as, as March, uh, and so it would be a great opportunity to, for me to be able to overlap with that person. I believe that God has a future for international churches and God has a future for our convention as we try to support and to help our our churches and I'm eager to see how God will work in the future all because of the gospel we believe that knowing Jesus Christ and following him offers a better way of living and the gospel is the only way to Christ to God Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. He is hope and he is help. I like the way that uh, pastor and author Tim Keller puts the message of the gospel. He says, the gospel, which is God's good news, teaches us that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. But we are also more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared to hope. We don't like to think of ourselves as being sinful and flawed, but the Bible says that we are. It's the truth about us. And that's the reason we need the gospel. But alongside that truth is that God demonstrated His love for us. And we are more loved and and accepted in Jesus Christ than we could ever hope. Jesus died for sinners, and we are all of us sinners. His death on the cross shows us just how serious, how sinful sin is, and it also shows us how deep God's love and God's acceptance to us is. Paul and Barnabas and perhaps a few others started the church in Philippi around the year A.D. 51. Uh, You can read that story in the book of Acts, chapter 16. And it started with a small group of praying women. A woman named Lydia, who was a businesswoman, a wealthy expat. There was also a demon-possessed slave girl who made money for her masters by telling fortunes. And a jailer, perhaps a retired uh, Roman soldier whose life and family were changed when an earthquake took place in the jail and Paul shared the gospel. These people dared to own Jesus Christ as their Lord in a city that was very famous for saying that Caesar, the king, is Lord. And for some ten years, the church and Paul supported each other. For their part, they supported Paul financially and emotionally as they kept up with him uh, even in times when he was in prison. They visited him in prison, and Paul writes from prison, probably in Rome. And Paul, on his part, encouraged them as they faced resistance and even persecution. And when Paul needed to, he challenged them to remain true to the gospel. 
and to practice uh, the gospel in their relationships with one another. It was a true partnership in the gospel. And Paul writes to the church for their, to thank them for their financial contribution that they had made to him and also for sending Epaphroditus, one of their members, uh, who, who brought the gift and who also stayed with Paul and encouraged him. He thanked them for the love that they had shown him while he was suffering in prison. And this letter that he wrote we call the book of Philippians. And so we're going to look at uh, the beginning of that book where Paul talks about the partnership in the gospel as he greets his friends, his brothers and sisters in Christ who made up the church. So let's listen first, and then I want us to look at the beginning of, the, of this book. Paul, Paul writes to the believers, he says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, always, in all my prayers, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, you are always, I I have the affection of Christ for you. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the praise or to the glory and praise of God. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, we treasure your word, and now I pray that you would take the words of Scripture and our thoughts on them this morning, and Lord, you would speak to our hearts. We come before you, Lord, with ears that are ready to listen and eyes that are ready to see what you have for us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Let's look at this gospel-centered partnership that Paul talks about. I think in those first two verses, we see what is at the very heart of any gospel-centered partnership. Notice carefully the words that Paul uses here. He says, Paul and Timothy, he was with Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. And he writes to all the saints. Uh, we read the, uh, uh, the creed a little earlier and it referred to saints. Maybe, maybe you don't think of yourself as a saint, but uh, God calls you a saint. We'll talk a little bit more about that. He calls all of the believers in the church saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. And then together with the overseers and deacons, the leaders that they had in the church. And Paul, as he traditionally was, says grace and peace. The Greek greeting, the Hebrew greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at that for just a moment. First of all, knowing Jesus is a personal and transforming experience. Did you notice in those verses how many times he refers to Jesus just as in his greeting? Christ Jesus, he says two times. And then in the second verse, the grace and peace of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In fact, if you read through the New Testament, that little phrase, in Christ, is practically a definition for Paul of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's someone who belongs to Christ, who is in Christ. It's a person who has a personal relationship with Christ. It's more than just calling yourself a Christian. It expresses a commitment to Christ. Christianity is above everything else about Christ. It's not first a set of doctrines that we say we believe or even a code of ethics that we try to live our lives by. It's not a way of worshiping. It's not a particular building. It's not about particular programs. All of those things are important, but Christ is the center of our faith, and He is the head of our church. And Paul focuses on that and emphasizes that from the very beginning. Notice the people he mentions here. He says, himself, Peter, uh, Paul and Timothy, we are only servants, he says, of Christ Jesus. And he writes to the saints, a, uh, a word which means the holy ones. People who have been separated to God because of their uh, commitment to Christ, Jesus. And then he also writes to their leaders, the overseers and deacons. For us, at our best, we ought to see ourselves like Paul and Timothy saw themselves as servants of Christ Jesus. We belong to Him. He is our Lord, our Master. I think it was last year when I was here that we talked about Philippians chapter 2, where Paul describes our Lord and Master, who being in very nature God, humbled Himself and became a servant. But Paul says he is a servant of Christ Jesus. And the church members, those who are in the church, he calls them saints because they are separated to God. And we need leaders and rejoice in leaders as they point us to Jesus and as who transforms our lives. They have been set, a, they set apart and He works in our lives as we become more like Him. And so the church is made up of the saints in Jesus Christ. Now the Philippian church was not a perfect church. They were having some challenges. Nor is your church or any other church a perfect church. Because we are made up of imperfect people. Like someone said, to live above with saints I love, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints I know, well that's another story. <laughs> we're, we're not perfect, we are on our way seeking to become what God wants us to do. Christ is working in us and He wants to work through us. No wonder Paul mentions grace and peace in his greeting. It is only by God's grace, favor that He gives to us that we don't deserve. That's the only way that we can find peace. A relationship with God and with others. And God brings this grace and peace through Jesus Christ. So Paul, from the very start, wants them to know that they are a family. They are a community. They're a group of people who belong together. Read through the book of Philippians and maybe circle the word all. And also the little phrase, together with. Paul is constantly saying, and in these, in these verses, many times, he said, I always pray for all of you with joy. Paul wants them to know that they are a family of believers. We belong to one another because we belong to Christ. Look around you and you find people from many, many different parts of the world. Many backgrounds, many races, many nationalities, cultures, many different languages, many different religious histories and personal experiences. Probably I could stir up something if we want to talk about politics. <laughs> There's so much diversity in a church. But what unites us is Jesus Christ. And one day, 
The only thing that will characterize us is that we are united together to worship and praise Jesus Christ in heaven. And here we are, already practicing it as an international church. But I think that partnership also goes beyond the local church. In my role, I I visit IBC churches almost every week. We're we're a very scattered family from uh, Norway down to South Africa and Argentina, from the west in Costa Rica over to the east in Dubai. And I see how working together we can accomplish more than working alone. Uh, At our men's conference, uh, Lauren Holland is there, and he is a young church planter in Rome who is planting a a second church that we have have in Rome. And we are helping to support him and his family. In Paris, we are working with uh, uh, our pastor there, Parker Wendell, who they've had a church for a long time, but they have a vision of planting churches in every sector of Paris because there are so many English-speaking people there. And we're helping to support an intern who is helping uh, in, church, in church planting. Not long ago, I spoke with and we are working with Pastor Ertan in Turkey, who is leading a group of churches who are ministering to the flood of refugees in their country and sharing the gospel with them. It's a very small a uh, group of evangelical churches, but they're planting several churches and we're helping to support them together in partnership. We're helping to support churches that are struggling for many different reasons. This year we have helped support a church planter in Latvia, uh, up in northern, northern Europe, as they have tried to reach people with the gospel, particularly young families through marriage workshops, Uh, as a way of introducing the gospel to them. All of these are just examples of partnership. Koinonia, the New Testament word, sometimes translated fellowship. And you know what fellowship is? Someone said it's it's just two fellas in the same ship, you know, on the same boat. (laughs) Together, together. It means we, we share something in common and we are together. So Paul says partnership is crucial and at the very heart of a gospel-centered church is Jesus Christ. But I want us to go on in verse, beginning in verse 3, and I think we see something of the health of a gospel-centered partnership. I've listed a few of those ingredients, uh, generosity, prayer, joy, uh, excuse me, gratitude, prayer, joy, generosity, and confidence. Listen for those things as we look at those verses. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I think that churches thrive, they are healthy and growing when they remember What brought them together, their their DNA. The church in Philippi began with the gospel being shared and embraced. And lives were changed there from the very beginning. And Paul wants to make sure that this continues in the church. Now I've listed a few of the qualities of the church. And of Paul as he thinks about the church. First of all, there was gratitude. He said, I thank my God every time I remember you. And then there was prayer. Paul was thankful for them and what God was doing to them. And so he prayed for them regularly. And he said, every time I pray with you for you, I pray it with joy. A third quality. And if you read through the book of Philippians, you find this theme of joy going all through the book. 
Remember, it was written from a guy that was sitting in prison. But joy is the theme of the book. Joy is central to this letter of Paul in spite of him being a Roman prisoner awaiting trial. And then there was this, there's this element of generosity that characterized the church at Philippi. God had been generous to them. That's what grace is. And they were, had been generous to Paul. It's no wonder that Paul thanked them every time he remembered them. And then there was confidence. Paul said, I am confident that God is going to continue his work in the church. Paul was confident that the church had a future. God was using them to change people's lives even as he was changing them. And he remembers, he says, from the first day until now. This relationship had begun the first day that the church started, and it was strengthened through difficult times. Paul writes from prison in danger of losing his life. But the church had also faced the fires of resistance and persecution. And these challenges had forged a friendship in the church. People who have gone through difficult times, who have prayed for each other and suffered together, have a very close bond. And these believers had such a bond. Someone said fire and fellowship forge friendship. But I think it's true that every church faces challenges. Relationships can be messy even among good growing Christian workers. Paul will talk about a difficulty that two women were having in the church as he writes this book. But our gospel is a gospel of reconciliation. And God gives us the desire and the ability to restore broken relationships when we face them, when we admit our part in the conflict, and when we seek to restore with a brother or sister in Christ. Being together is messy, but it's God's way of building a family and friends. We're members of a body. I think the Philippian church may have been Paul's favorite church. It was a church that was faithful, strategic, cooperative, and generous. I say that because in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul uses this church as the example to all the other churches of what generosity looks like in a church. They had forged friendships as they had served together, struggled together, suffered together, and supported one another. And this is my hope for our group of churches. We face joys and struggles and hardships working together to make disciples of all nations as we do life together. One of your men, I asked, I said, what do you want me to tell Uh, the people at the church and he said well tell them we're having a great time and we're learning a lot and one of them said it is wonderful that we can be here in this place with almost 200 other men who love the Lord and grow together that's fellowship that's partnership and then Paul prays for the church and I think his prayer can help us to see what his heart bleeds for A gospel-centered partnership. Paul says, this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So that you may be able to discern what is best. And may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise of God. Do you notice... What Paul prays for them, he prays that their love would abound more and more. That they would grow in love. More love. Love for the Lord and love for each other. Church, it is love that provides a fertile soil for good decision making in a church. And also it provides good soil for healthy discipleship. In the church. Paul prays that they would have love. He loved them. And so he prays for them. And the central theme of his prayer. Is that their love would grow. 
I'm afraid that sometimes when churches have challenges, love gets set to the side. But it's the most important thing, especially when we have difficulties with others or we have challenges that are, that are difficult. Great preaching and Bible study, dynamic worship, impressive buildings and budgets, organization, all of those things are good. But if love is not there, these other things cannot bring glory to God, nor can a church be healthy apart from love. When conflicts come and they will, love can bring healthy solutions. When sin occurs among members, love can restore those who have strayed. Love helps a church to make good decisions and build healthy disciples. I pastored for, for many years and uh, am thankful for all of the experiences that I've had. But about five years ago, God really touched my heart about the importance of not only of, uh, you know, discipleship from the pulpit and, and through programs, but one-on-one or one-on-two discipleship. And our church in Frankfurt, about two years ago, we began to, to make as a central core of our church uh, discipleship, triads, three people, men with men, women with women, who would spend about six months with each other, Sharing their burdens, sharing their lives together, praying together, sharing their hurts, their aspirations, and growing together with a goal that when they finished the sixth month, then all three of them would take two others and disciple them or work with them in a discipleship triad. And it's been a tremendous blessing to me. I'm currently working with uh, two German guys. One of them is a, a banker with the uh, uh, Cent- European Central Bank. And another is a, a younger guy who's just finished university. As we share life together, and I think that this is what Paul is encouraging them, to have love for one another by doing life together. We need to do it as an entire church, but we also need to do it in smaller groups together. God treasures right theology. We need to believe the right things. He treasures right living. And He also treasures right relationships. And we ought to treasure those things as well. Paul's prayer for the church was that their love would would grow. And because of what Christ had done They were righteous in God's eyes. And so Paul prays that they would experience the fruit of that righteousness. God wasn't content, and He isn't content that our faith just remains up in the head, but He wants it to to permeate every aspect of our lives. Righteousness will have fruit. And God is working in our lives as Paul prays for them that they would be pure and blameless. He helps us to live that kind of life when we walk with Him together. God longs to see His people loving Him and loving one another so that they can impact their world. And that kind of church, a healthy, gospel-centered church, Paul says in verse 11, brings glory and praise to God. So, be encouraged, church. God was at work in Philippi and God is at work here in Zurich, in your church. He's moving you forward. He began the good work, and He will continue it. Find joy in serving the Lord and one another. And never forget that the same gospel, the same good news that teaches us that we're more sinful and flawed than we ever want to believe, but we're also more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. That same gospel is to be lived in our lives every day. It will sustain us and it will help us to grow. There are no perfect churches, but a gospel-centered community produces joyful, healthy disciples and brings glory and praise to God. And I pray that God would help your church to continue to be that kind of church. Let me just close with three questions for you to think about, some applications from this text for living. First of all, have you believed the gospel? 
Have you come to a place where you have recognized that not only have you made mistakes, but you have committed sins against God? And that your sin has separated you from God. But that God has made it possible for you to come back to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, who we have sung about this morning. Who on the cross paid the price for our sins and became the the bridge from death to life by dying for our sins. And then He was raised from the dead and offers life. He offers forgiveness. He offers hope. He offers eternal life. Have you believed the gospel? If not, I pray that you will. That God would draw you to Himself even this morning. And second question is, if you have believed the gospel, are you living a gospel-centered life? Is the Word of God and and the Spirit of God and the ways of God... uh, transforming your life day by day, working in your heart and you're living out the gospel in your life? Are you living a gospel-centered life? And then finally, how wide is your circle? Paul had a very wide circle of friends, this entire church that he wrote to, but he also developed friendships far beyond that so that he could share the gospel. How wide is your circle. Because those on the outside need us on the inside to share the gospel with them. How wide is your circle? Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, for the, your word that is true. I thank you for men like the Apostle Paul who love this church who love the people in Philippi to even start a church, and then who stayed with them and encouraged them and challenged them. And I thank you for this church, Lord, that was faithful to you. They were an example to other churches. And I pray for IBC Zurich. Pray for Bob and the other leaders in the church. Pray for all of the, the members of the church Lord, that this would always be a gospel-centered church, believing the gospel and living the gospel each day. And Lord, I pray for any who might be here this, this morning who have never responded to the gospel, that you would help them to take a step toward you even this morning, that they would find someone to explain how they can have a personal relationship with Christ who is at the center of the gospel. And Lord, we will thank you for all the ways that you lead us in the days ahead by your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.